Welcome to A Little Bit Radical, a business podcast from Standing on Giants. I'm Rob, your host. Join me as I meet people and organisations who are doing things differently, challenging the status quo and yes, might just be a little bit radical. It's estimated that the world's servers and data centres account for roughly 2% of all global carbon emissions. If I asked you to picture the company at the forefront of tackling the huge environmental impact of the internet, you might not imagine a six-person outfit working in Harrogate, Yorkshire, but that's exactly who Interact are. This year, Interact beat Microsoft to the award for Energy Impact at the Data Centre Design Awards, the Oscars for the industry, so I'm told. I'm speaking to Rich Kenny today, the MD of Interact. Rich is also Sustainability and Research Director at TechBuyer, a global supplier of sustainable IT solutions. And as if that wasn't enough, he's also a research fellow at London South Bank University. Rich, welcome to the podcast. Hey Rob, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much for joining us. I mean, first of all, I think you're the first guest we've had who's got three jobs. How do you balance it all? <laughs> That's, that's only three of them. There's actually a couple of others. I sit on a few boards as well. Blimey. Primarily for green skills development and for a couple of charities. A lot of them tie closely together. You know, the research sustainability ties in nicely with the research fellow job and Interact is very much a research and data-based business. So they all kind of intersect quite beautifully at that area of accurate reporting on sustainability. So they all, yeah, they, they interestingly tie together. If you are a little bit radical, Rich, and you're on this podcast, so we know that you are, what's in your early life set you up for that? I actually bought and sold my first server when I was nine. This is kind of an interesting thing. I used to, um, with my brother, we used to reconfigure computers like the original IBM, like 286 and 386s. We'd go to auctions, buy them, reconfigure them on site, and then resell them to people when they got there. And I've been doing that since I was sort of nine, ten years old. So uh, I was first looking at IT before the IT managers knew what IT was, really. And I, I actually bought my first Unix server, which is like a 42U half-ton machine. Uh, a Wharfdale liquidation audit and had to had my mum have to help me put it in the car to drive it home and it sat on our kitchen table for uh, about four months while I harvest the parts so and that was a good 30 years ago a little bit interesting the other thing I guess that's fairly radical is that when I left school all I wanted to be was a professional sportsman and I was a pretty canny boxer pretty decent wrestler so I was on the UK's first professional MMA fighters no way yeah I think that's a little bit radical absolutely they're actually one of the things that opened my doors to my first two major jobs goodness me right a couple of things to get into there <laughs> I'm going to leave the MMA to one side for a second but I think we should come back to it so first of all when you were configuring your first computers at age nine, what was it about IT, computers and technology that drew you to it? I love a puzzle. Like, I love jigsaws. My brain works that way. It works really well with taking things, looking at them from those different angles and seeing how they could fit together differently. So when I looked at computers, I never saw a whole unit. I saw lots of interconnected pieces, which, if you moved them around, basically became something different. For me, PCs was awesome. You opened them up, but everyone else was scared to open the case. I was, like, levering them over with crowbars and just being like, if I move this and do this, does it still work? If I do this, does it still work? Can I program directly to this? Can I write on this? Yeah, it was just a very a very technical and physical puzzle. So I just loved that. I loved it. And to begin with, it was about tuning the PCs so we could play games faster and we could, you know do local networks with my friends and stuff so we could play games together and that's what it was initially about i just like the experimentation i like the creativity of what you could do with hardware well before i was doing it with software so yeah i guess it was like the exploration and the uh the hands-on nature of it that i loved i think we're going to come to how you've paired that with this kind of drive for impact and sustainability later when we get into the work section yeah. of the podcast so let's not leave this golden nugget of <laughs> that you were a professional MMA fighter lie. Talk to us about how your experience as a professional sportsman may or may not have influenced you as a business person. Yeah, it's interesting because I was one of the first pros because I was one of the ones that fought the most often. I certainly wasn't the best. You know, I haven't got a lot of physical talents. I'm not the fastest. I probably am one of the strongest because strength is something you can build and create. So from a very young age, I'd love lifting weights. So I'd walk into every fight thinking, well, I'm probably stronger than this guy, but he's probably better than everything else. So the only thing I can control in a fight was how strong or how fit I was. But yeah, I never lost a decision. I, I tried never to go to decision. And I think for me was the discipline required to get better, to control the controllables, became really effective for work. Because at worst, I wasn't getting hit in the face. At best, 
all the groundwork I knew I'd done got, got me ready. I kind of learned the, the art of organization and preparation, which I think is transferable to every single job or anything you apply yourself to, is that if you can walk into every situation the best prepared you can be, then the outcome's kind of predefined and predecided. You know, it's one of those cheesy ones, like, you know, one of those things from Sun Tzu where it's kind of like, you know, the, the battle's won well before it's fought. It's in the preparation. And that, I think that's really true. And I think that's true for sports. Short of a couple of really athletic, like, monsters, most people are just the ones that have applied themselves for the longest, worked the hardest and put the, as much of their heart and soul as they can into it. And I think that's for everything, whether that's sport, business, family, um, you know, all the things that really matter is just a matter of putting time in and you tend to get a good result. I'm starting to see how with that discipline and organisation, you're able to hold down those five plus positions <laughs> that we were talking about. So as you've become an adult, we've talked about your nine-year-old self tinkering around with computers. Have you become more or less radical as you've become an adult and as you've built your businesses? It's a good question. Like, I think I've become probably less, but I'd imagine that most people probably still don't see it that way. I guess what I've hoped is that the world's more aligned itself to the way I think. I'm less of an outlier and more in the mainstream because hopefully everyone else is falling in line. Can you give us an example of that? Yeah, well, like, when I didn't get into university, I went and worked as a job in the gym and I was training and I was, you know, and it, was, it was all good. It was about playing sport and having a good time. And then I decided that what I really wanted to do was poverty alleviation, and this would be 20 years ago. So I kind of went out there to find a degree that would allow me to apply an economics-based mindset to solving world problems. And this is 20 years ago we're talking about. And then I ended up going to university to study poverty alleviation and international development through economics and politics. In that group of people, everyone was very much an environmental scientist. It was quite hippie. That course was quite like, hey, do good, man, Marxism, all that sort of stuff. And I was like, well, how do we apply financial and economic thinking to improve livelihoods? So even on those sort of courses, everyone else was writing, you know, their dissertations on, you know, how to improve farming yields in low-income countries. And I was like, what would happen if you massively improved military spending? Would that help the poorest? And, you know, I remember sitting there and people being horrified by my first dissertation on, you know, what's the benefit of military spending on pro-poor growth? And everyone going, this is the worst thing that's ever been written by anybody ever, because you're basically encouraging dictators to have massive standing armies. And I was like, well, yeah, but if you look at the actual science and the math behind it, like, as long as you're spending the arms spending on people, as in, like, recruiting troops and not on tanks and military equipment, you're fundamentally providing livelihoods for people that have poor opportunities. There's a very clear improvement structure within an army where you can better yourself within those confines. The most politically unstable nations are those that are moving from a pre-democracy to democracy. They're the ones that have the highest incidences of inequality and effectiveness. So, actually, you're better off having a large standing army and stabilizing control. That's actually a better outcome for a lot of people from an economics and an inequalities point of view, by the way. But it was the idea. I mean, I don't believe that at all. I don't think that's a good idea at all. I think military spending is, you know, has a place, I guess, within world politics and power structures, but isn't something we should be encouraging. But I just kind of like to look at the counterpoint and go, why can't I say this? Why can't I look at this and go, maybe an army is a good thing. Maybe a massive army is a good thing. Maybe it's better than spending it on welfare who knows so i've always kind of wanted to look at things that way rather than just say this is how it is and i'll toe the line with that i was always kind of like but why but what and i think that mindset is i've always had that i've always had that mindset of what happens if i do this and i think that's helped me and the businesses i've been part of be quite successful because that's what everyone else is looking at could we look at something else absolutely and i think you've tapped into a theme with lots of our guests there which is i'd say ultimately a curiosity for how things might be able to be different to the status quo, but also really solid critical thinking and asking, is this accepted knowledge really true? You know, and let's investigate it. Yeah. And I think what you say in regards to like, have I become less radical? I think it's been more acceptable to have divergent thinking than it used to be, you know, in the eighties, nineties and early two thousands. I remember at school, you had to very closely huddle around what was common and what was accepted if you want to fit in. And I was never really bothered about that. Because I was kind of like, I don't want to think that way. I don't want to do things that way. I, I don't mind being on my own. Like, I'm quite happy to be my, on my own person and do my own thing, so long as it's not hurting anybody. My understanding when I speak to lots of young people, and I speak to a lot of them at the side, is people have become a little bit more comfortable with having an opinion. And at the same time, worryingly, they've become more worried about being ostracized because of things like impact of social media and stuff. So it's a really strange time for young people and young adults. I think it's a really, really hard time. Everything is less radical. It's just more accepted that there's a much wider average score. Do you know what I mean? Now, not everything clusters around the middle. I just think that the medium's wider, to be honest. Yeah. 
And the Overton window has shifted somewhat yeah. towards how you were, you know, 20 years ago or whatever. So more of the general consensus is in line with how you were thinking. Yeah, I think so. And you're a little bit ahead of your time. Let's get into your work because there's a lot to get into. I said that we'd pick up the nine-year-old tinkering away on the desk again. So at what point did that puzzle become about energy and the environment and the impact that our reliance on technology and data and the internet has on the environment? At what point did it become about that for you? I kind of moved into project management when I left uni and a lot of it was project manager around like poverty alleviation, then I went to digital. And just rather interestingly, like I left one job who I work with now just sort of like on projects and they asked me to go and work for them and that was a tech buyer. So I'd literally had a break from being like 14 or 15 to play with tech to doing more like software and like large scale project management. And then Kevin Towers and Chris Pooley from Tech Buyer, I ended up having about 10 hours worth of interviews with them to come and work and, and solve a problem they were having. And it just so happened that they were working with servers in circular refurbishment. And so we came into the business and was just there to kind of provide a software solution to a hardware problem. I just tried to Kevin, tried to Chris and just really liked them. I really liked the ESOF of our refurbishment. And as we were working at Tech Brian, I'd been there about a year, a lady called Astrid joined. And she was like an ex-journalist and just a really smart, but a very, what I would class as a divergent thinker. She sees things that other people just don't see. And she just was like, do you know we're a circular economy business? And I was like, I've never even heard that term. I don't know what that means. This would be five, six years ago. And she walked me through it and I was like, yeah, well, that's what we do. And she went out and just explored that niche. And it was at the time when circular economy wasn't, no one was really talking about it, far from maybe like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And she was kind of explaining it and pushing it into the business to say, this is what we do. And it's really special. As she was talking about, I was like, that aligns everything I feel passionate about, everything in my life that I love, technology, environment, all sort of responsibility and sort of improving social inequality through access to digital skills. It was that thing and that collaboration with Kevin, with Astrid, that led to us then taking a research project with the University of East London and Innovate UK, which led to us creating Interact. So we were looking at what we were doing and we were kind of like, I don't think what everyone's saying is true. Everyone was saying, don't worry about the IT, it gets better every year, it'll always make energy improvements. And I was like, can we prove that? Can we look at that? And so we did, and we carried out a project with some very smart people. And during the project, it was clear that that wasn't true. I mean, I always say this, we accidentally disproved Moore's law, which is a fundamental law of computing, that computers all it realistically chips, halve in size or double in performance and energy efficiency every two years. And it's not true. It stopped being true in about 2014. And we kind of highlighted that point in our research. It got published in the IEEE Journal of Sustainable Computing, which is a very prestigious journal. And that led us to say, well, we've got some real confidence in what sort of research we can do as an organization. So let's spin something out of that. So me and Kev sat down and we decided that we'd start Interact to basically provide like the machine learning tool into the market to say, you should look at the hardware and not the building. It's one of those weird things. It's just a completely new way of thinking and going, everyone's looking at the building. I want to look underneath. Why do we have a building? You know, so the data center sector was like, let's optimize cooling. Let's make it as efficient as possible to cool hardware. And my immediate thought and Astrid's thought and, and you know, Ravi's thoughts on this was what we call it. Well, hardware, right, so who's working on that? And the answer was absolutely no one. And we were like, cool, we'll do that. So with like tons of support from tech buyer, some very, very smart people, some ex excellent thinkers, we create a product that's, I think, having a big impact. It's really starting to find its stride. What's interesting is it's requiring everybody else to change their mindset. And that's really hard. Educating a market on something that doesn't exist. You know, I call it like, you know, educating on the art of the possible. You know, there's huge opportunities for everybody, but they do need to shift their mindset because you look at one thing for so long, it's all you see, isn't it? Absolutely. Paint us the picture of the kind of global consumption of data and the internet and how that connects to emissions. Yeah. How big of a problem is this? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because it's a problem. It's, problems are tricky work because it's loaded, isn't it? But like the data center sector, so the enterprise IT, that's servers and networking, that's about 1% to 2% of global emissions and energy. Combined all digital services, which includes data and transfer of data, networks, laptops, all that sort of stuff. And it can be running as high as 8% of global emissions, which is, you know, pretty comparable with wow. global freight, basically. So it's huge. It's, it's a massive, massive impact. Now, the advantage of digitalization is quite clear. It underpins all the 17 of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. But all that digitalization can be more effective and more efficient. There's a really good example I always talk about, and I've taken this from a very clever guy called Rabbit. They did like a brief study on the impact of data and data transference across the world and, and where the environmental impact lies. The example they use is the song Despacito from, I think it was 2016. It was the most streamed song of that year. 
something like 7 billion downloads or something. And that actually used globally the same energy consumption as four African nations, like quite large nations as well. This isn't like Burkina Faso, this is like Sudan, this is like, you know, Ethiopia and stuff. And the reason behind that was not where it sits on the computer, but how it gets there. So the actual data centers were, say, using 5% or 10% of that power to store it, like YouTube, to store the video. But when you stream a video over data networks, it requires energy to pass it globally. And the less efficient that transfer system, the less efficient the network, so 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, they all have multipliers on the energy required to transfer that data. So if you consume data on Wi-Fi, we'll we'll give that a score of one, it uses one unit. If you have it on 4G, it uses three units to stream the exact same media, but through a different network. If you do 3G, it's 12 units. Wow. The way you consume data can make it 12 times worse than another method. And that's just the transference from data centers. So you've got the data center, you then transfer it to wherever those networks look like. And the reason Despacito had such an impact was because it was consumed quite a lot in Asia and in, in India, where the networks are fairly poor. They're, they're 3G networks at best. So most of the consumption was that. And then it was, where is the media being consumed? If it's on a phone, it's pretty efficient. If it's on a laptop, it's less efficient. If it's on a TV, it's even less efficient. What you're streaming it in, is it HD or SD? Because if it's standard definition, it's three times more efficient than high definition. But you can't stream a high definition song through your phone in standard definition and see the benefit against high definition. So it's three times worse, but you've seen none of the benefit. So looking at all those interplaying aspects, what you're saying is, if I look at a song on my phone in high definition in 3G, it's 36 times worse than consuming it on Wi-Fi on standard definition. And these aren't small numbers. You know, I'm telling you, it's for African nations. It's a sizable energy consumption for one song. And it's the same with social media. You know, you scroll and you you look at a picture. When that picture downloads to your phone, it uses data to transfer it, to stream it. You then save it. It then gets backed up by the cloud. So you send it again somewhere else. They then replicate it and back it up somewhere else. Within that same sort of study that was looking at Despacito, they looked at what happens when Ronaldo posts a picture and when Ronaldo was posting a picture on Instagram it was consuming the same energy as six and a half UK households for the year for that one photo for that one point in time based on the, the volume of followers he had how many people were likely to see the meet all that sort of stuff so what you're talking about is a photo using six and a half homes worth of energy for the year for a throwaway thing that you don't care about so when you're there snapping pictures of your lunch and you're there taking photos of a park bench from 27 different angles well, none of which you're ever going to look at ever again all of these have an energy and storage impact, and it's environmentally quite crippling. Wow, that's blowing my mind, Rich, frankly. I think me and most of the people listening to this podcast, when we think about our personal energy consumption, we think about plugging our phone into the wall and the energy that it might take to, you know, to charge it and pretty much negate it. You know, I would say, you know, that can't be very much. But then all this the kind of rich tapestry that you're painting is really, really eye-opening. Thank you. Taking that problem that you've so well articulated how do you interact help these kind of enterprise companies tackle this problem yeah so we look at the compute aspect so doing the work so storage and data transfer is very much networks and storage and it's a big thing but realistically a lot of what you're doing involves globally us as people involves algorithms decision making all that sort of stuff and that fundamentally transforms into compute And depending on what a server is configured like, so the interplay of its components, usually it's the processor, the amount of RAM it's got in it, some aspects of storage and the the age and generation. Depending on that configuration, depends how effective it is at serving those services or doing that compute. And from what we've looked at, and I mean, I've done maybe 350 data centers in 18 months. I've probably seen the most data and most servers of anyone in the world at this point in time. And what we tend to see is that suboptimal configuration within these data centers and these enterprises are hemorrhaging energy. So we see some servers that are sat there at idle, which means they're doing nothing. And while they're sat there doing nothing, they're using more energy than the great kit they're doing to do high performance cluster research. And they have thousands of these servers just sat there doing nothing, providing no benefit, but burning megawatts of energy. And until recently, people haven't really been able to see how much bang they're getting for their buck. So with the work we've done, we generally see an energy reduction for the same compute just through reconfiguration or projects of 60 to 75%. So if we were to do that, the global data center and enterprise space, and everyone just took the recommendations that we would feed in from Interact, we'd look at reducing the world's carbon by about 0.6 to 0.7 of a percent, which is the same as the entirety of the UK. 
and there'd be no cost to this. It would just be a net benefit. And I would imagine there are dozens of companies like ourselves who have similar solutions in other areas of social impact, environmental impact, that people just aren't willing to try because they don't know it's possible. I think we can probably solve 40% of the world's carbon issues with solutions that are already out there and available, but would require somebody somewhere to be brave. The equivalent of reconfiguration, whether it's changing something quite simply, the new process that wouldn't be a huge investment. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think these exist everywhere. The way I would think is that the way you, we succeed as a planet is collaboration, not separation. Get all these people who've created wonderful things, put them all in the hat and decide where they're appropriate and effective. And I think we would solve a lot of the world's problems. We work really heavily in research now. We're, we're fairly well respected with research at Tech Barrett Interact, not just in our area, but everywhere, because we kind of know how to run a good research project. And we know we're output driven. We know what we're doing. And I've been involved in some sort of quite large awards for some like emerging technology. And the stuff I see has blown my mind. And it's given me a lot of confidence in the world going forward. And so when everything's a bit, a bit doom and gloom for, for a lot of people, I look at what some really smart teams are doing in the world. And I just think, you know, we could be on the precipice of a wonderful set of solutions, but it's going to require people to be brave. And I don't see a lot of brave people right now. I see a lot of scared people. And the people that are in positions of power within organizations are very risk averse. They play the same game they've played for 20, 30 years. They're accumulating wealth rather than accumulating what I would consider value, which is, you know, something that means their people are well looked after, their societies are reflected in their policies, that we look at stakeholder rather than shareholder primacy as an economic model for a business doesn't mean you can't make money but it shouldn't be the only thing you've got your eye on so i've seen some wonderful wonderful projects man and like stuff that's i looked at that and just thought you're really making a difference in the world tell us about a few of those projects that have stood out to you that have made you so optimistic for the future yeah i've seen some great medtech ones some great medtech stuff that have been in the same cohort as we have so we were top three rated research in the uk in 2021 on our ktp that led to interact and we were beaten by a solution from East Queen's College in Belfast, where they'd created a machine learning model for breast cancer. So looking at basically carrying out the scan as you would do for a breast cancer scan and having a massively high degree of certainty around emerging conditions that a doctor wouldn't catch because it's sort of pre-palpation stage. And they were looking at sort of improving cancer identification rates of like 70% for like months before a doctor would catch it. And they were then looking at applying that to other cancers. At that stage, all those cancers that early respond to treatment. So you're looking at this thing where you're going, if you just have a scan and it's a whole body scan and it identifies all these issues of cellular growth on a model that's incredibly effective and you go, you know, there's a good chance that 6% of this area is probably cancerous. Here's pre-treatment drugs that aren't destroying your immune system and killing you like, you know, like chemicals and stuff. I look at that and that's one solution and you go, Jesus, someone made that. That's so cool. Like, and they did it by going a different way. Rather than going, right, we've discovered it. How do we cure it? They've got, how do we find it before it needs curing? And I love that. And it, it, it excites me and it brings me a lot of hope and confidence. I think prevention rather than treatment across a number of industries, not just in medicine, but also when we look at climate and social problems is probably going to be the key to... Yeah, I think so. If that's what we do. Everyone else is looking at cooling the IT that's inefficient. We're like, sort the IT out. Yeah. You know, they're looking at curing the problem. We're looking at solving the problem we're not interested in treatment we're cure we're you know we're prevention and that's what no one else is doing is the prevention piece they're like it's already a problem how do we mitigate it it's like well, how do we stop it being a problem that's what we should be doing with as many problems as possible absolutely absolutely it's quite similar to what we do with communities if you create a fantastic customer experience built on trust and loyalty by building a community around your business then you don't need to look at your whole customer service and go oh, our customers hate us you know what can we do like what promotion can we give them or you know how can we trick them into staying with us you know <laughs> you know for a bit longer yeah. because they're going to leave because they hate us you know it's exactly the same thing don't stick a plaster over it and go don't worry guys discounts is your product making people happy is it affordable and effective and, and can people use it because that's kind of cool because if you can democratize everything so that people have access to it irrespective of condition you really understand the value you create Whereas you may not make yourself a millionaire, you might make a lot of people's lives better. But that, for me, is going to be the focus for success. It's got to be. You can't just be pounds and pence. As we're celebrating tangential thinking, I'm going to take it a slightly different direction now and ask you about Yorkshire. Because I get the sense that you're a proud Yorkshire business and that there's a lot of talk about 
levelling up in the UK and there has been for a number of years. Talk to us about what Yorkshire means to you and paint a picture of the kind of businesses you see emerging in your home county in that part of the world. And are you excited about what the future holds there? Yeah, I think we're lucky in Yorkshire because A, North Yorkshire is one of the biggest counties in the country, but it's incredibly rural. So we have issues with transport, we have issues with access to jobs. What's been amazing is sort of the impact of the pandemic on remote working, because what it's allowed is those really great people from York, Yorkshire and North Yorkshire to access global jobs. And I think we've become incredibly powerful because what we've got is loads of great people who didn't really want to commute nine hours. But now you don't have to. You can do an incredible amount of work from home. When you do go in, you can really collaborate. And I think it's important to go in and collaborate where you can. But, you know, I think they were saying something about Leeds the other day. And Leeds, which is obviously West Yorkshire, Leeds is one of the European lead hubs for technology, for innovation. You know, I was in Leeds last night. I was in Leeds on Tuesday at a Rising Stars pitch event. And I watched 12 businesses pitch like start early startups they were all amazing every single one of that cohort of city winners from yorkshire and this was the yorkshire city winners we were one of them and there was loads of other businesses in there and i looked at all of those businesses i was like these are so cool like and not cool as in it does something that you know my son might like when he's older or it gimmicky not gimmicky yeah and i was just like some of these could have real beneficial impact on our society there was one of them was like a stress app and it was like a wearable stress app that tracks your, your stress but then amalgamates it, anonymize it, and you buy it from for your company. And I looked at that, I'm like, geez, imagine if you could track with like really good accuracy, not individual people, because that's a daily privacy issue, but the overriding stress sentiment in your business on a daily and hourly basis, and identify what you as a business owner have done to cause those peaks and troughs. You know, imagine if you're looking at it going, right, when's our most stressful day? Monday at three o'clock. When's our least stressful day? You know, it's Thursday at 4 p.m. When's the worst day of the year? It's the day before we close our financial year or something. You know, this might be really obvious, but it might be that you sent out an email communicating, you know, that we're having a troubling time or something and that therefore we're looking at cost effectiveness and everyone's stress level rises by 70%. You need to identify a better way to communicate with your workforce that isn't causing them harm because stress is harmful. You know, no one performs well stressed. I mean, stress is a necessary biological imperative to make certain decisions, but it's, it's not a period you want to be living under for a long period of time. To be able to track that within an organization would be incredible because I bet if you had a stress tracking wearable at most of the major tech firms right now, everybody at their highest levels of stress ever in light of the redundancies we're seeing from sort of, you know, Google, Apple, Microsoft, everyone else. Yeah. And you just think the way you're communicating with your people is hurting everybody, even the ones that you like to keep. I guarantee there are massive like levels of stress, sleep science, and mental dishealth throughout these huge organizations because of how we're communicating. And there's, I think, hopefully simple solutions that will solve that. And they're probably going to come out of Yorkshire by the looks of it. We punch above our way, and I'm proud of that. Brilliant. That was the kind of answer I expected to get from you. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for that, Rich. So we're going to lift you out of your day-to-day now. You've been involved in a number of projects which do create a kind of real-world, kind of far-reaching impact, if you like. But What's one area, if there was a change you could make in the world that's not something that you personally can impact, what would you like to see in the world? What I would love is meritocratic promotion with the right person for the right job. I think it would solve our political issues, I think it would solve our environmental issues, and I think it would solve a lot of our social issues as well. That's what I would love. I'd love it if the right person got picked and it wasn't politics and networks and nepotism. Tell us more about that one. I'm not sort of one way or the other when it comes to politics. What I'm always disappointed with with politics is that nobody seems to really care about the job they're in or whether or not they're qualified to do it. It's just like a a slippery ladder to climb to try and get to the top and hang on to power. And I look at that and I think, I'll take the example of like social care. Social care is probably one of the most important things. But social workers have my utmost admiration in every aspect of what they do. They do such an important job. But it's one of the most low-paid jobs out there and it's underserved, underprovided. It would have a massive impact on the NHS if we had more social care. We'd have a lot less people claiming stuff. Why is the right person not advising? Because I know loads of good people in that area who have loads of really great initiatives. But I guarantee they would never, ever, ever be able to be in a position to gain the ear of somebody who could make a meaningful change because they're not someone that they went to school with or they're not someone that went from the same networks. And that's what I think is a real problem because I think what you've got is a load of people that are marginalised from society in jobs. They have really active and involved communities, but they're marginalised from most key roles. And those thinkers and those innovators are a treasure trove of progress. 
and I don't think they'll ever get the right job that they deserve or the one where they could have the most impact. That's something that pains me a little bit. I'm with you there. I like the example of social care. I've got two anecdotes to add. I don't normally add anecdotes to the podcast, but I want to because these were just great. And they actually both came from Channel 4, I think, in Channel 4 documentaries. So talking about with the context of are the right people even collaborating with the right people to solve these issues? Possibly not. So one Channel 4 documentary, which was fantastic, was it took a group of teenagers who were not in education, employment or training, and then essentially gave them work experience. So followed them around doing certain jobs. And they went to work for a very well-known trainer company in the factory. They went and I think worked in a restaurant. I think it was you know reasonably you know, well-known brand there as well. And then they went to work in a care home. And I think if you guessed beforehand which of those they'd have the most affinity with, you wouldn't have guessed the care home. And for sure, when they turned up and sort of saw what they were going to be doing, they were kind of a bit, you know, <laughs> a bit taken aback. But that was by far and away the most positive experience that they all had. And they all, you know, made friends with the old people that they were caring for. And they all felt really energized by that job. Whereas in the trainer factory, they did not care they started messing around well they felt probably like how a lot of workers end up feeling which is you're just a part of a machine and you're a number and no one really cares and just take this to there and that's it and then go home i thought that was fascinating and i thought what a tragedy that there's probably such a tiny percentage of teenagers leaving school who even it's even on their radar that they could work in social care and enjoy it but in this experiment all of them like had their mind open to that and were keen on it and the second one was a brilliant experiment, again, that Channel 4 did, where they combined essentially a nursery and an old people's home. And so they had these old people there helping to look after two, three-year-olds, four-year-olds. And I remember one scene really vividly where there was this woman who couldn't walk anymore. Well, she, you know, she walked with a frame. And they had, on like the last day, like a sports day. And the little girl that she'd made a kind of friendship with ran off. And this woman, can't remember her name, like literally chucked the Zimmer frame and ran after her. And she like ran for the first time, you know, in however many years. Completely transformative for these people. And I think both of those examples are just great, just thinking a bit differently about it, combining things, collaboration, like you say. And I watched both of those things. And I was like, great, well, if I'm a government minister, thank you, Channel 4, you've solved my issues, but has it gone anywhere? Like, those are both great examples. And like you said, good ideas. When I said earlier, you know, that I think the solution to the problems are there. You know, there's two prime examples of things that with a bit of thought, a bit of effort, could make people's lives better. You know, you're dealing with the loneliness around old people that are causing health problems and NHS admittances by people who are actually quite well but bored. Minor things is kind of a bit of a day out to go to the doctors because it's killing time and at least they're seeing people or speaking to people. They're dealing with chronic loneliness. And at the other end, you're dealing with childcare, where people are saying, well, I can't get childcare, it's too expensive, it means I can't work. And what you have is this wonderful symbiosis of caring, because that's how it used to be in families. Like, that's what it would have been like. You'd have had all families in one roof. You know, the older would care for the younger, so they were serving a, a viable purpose. This is how tribal communities have always been. I'm not saying it has to be like that, but I think there are solutions that aren't that difficult. And the one thing for me is, I just don't think the right roles are paid the right amount or valued in the way they should be. Because if you look at a care worker and they're on minimum wage, I wouldn't do that job for minimum wage. I'd do it for free. Like, mm -hmm. I'd do it because it's the right thing to do. And if I, you know, if I didn't have to have money, I would do that. Uh -huh. But it's chronically underpaid. The career pathways are non-existent. You're a care worker and then you might be a manager. But why isn't more work a pathway to nursing if you want to do that? And why uh -huh. isn't nursing a pathway to being a doctor? Because a lot of the stuff you see, it's like, okay, you go to medical school for five years and you're a doctor, congratulations, a couple more years doing some other bits and pieces, you can specialise, wonderful. Why can't some of that time be taken off and have a whole pathway where you could go from social work to surgeon? Because what you'd probably find is that I think every single doctor in the world would be better if they spent a year or two doing social work, then be a doctor, because I think they'd have a real awareness of, at the bottom end, what they could have an impact on. If that sort of pathway was in place, we'd have loads of people in social work loads of people in nursing loads of really good doctors who generally care about people and those jobs would be seen as valued as where they are whereas everyone goes doctor's good job nurse's okay job social worker's a dos job it's like that couldn't be further from the truth they're all valuable and all equally valuable 
but they're not remunerated the same way and there's no pathway between them. And yet there are so many interlocking skills there that complement each other. And that's one simple thing. Like, why isn't that a thing? Why can't you do an apprenticeship as a doctor? You're honestly telling me that you can only learn this from a textbook. Talk about radical thinking, right? Like, I if I have to learn it from a book, it can't be the only way. Stuff like that, that I just think you, those industries, and it's all industries, pathways for progression based on merit and impact. That is the, the one thing I would love to change. I would love to see a remuneration scale based on the job's social and environmental impact. I think that would be really exciting. That'd be cool. <laughs> um, Rich, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much for your candor, your honesty, your great anecdotes. We always finish with the same question, which is if there's someone listening to this podcast who has a little bit of a radical idea that they want to see perhaps in business, perhaps in life, whatever, what advice would you give that person? Network, build a community and have people support you because doing stuff on your own is really, really, really hard. And we see an awful lot of sort of rhetoric in the press where it's like one great man you know there was a one great idea did you guys think do you know what it takes a city and it takes a town to build a person but to greatness and if you've got a great idea and you're going to need to be in front of a lot of people and you're going to need to move it forward you're going to need a lot of people behind you so build a community explore it provide value to that community and it will repay you and that will get your idea where it needs to go hopefully build community selling on giants can get behind that thank you very much rich Hope you have a wonderful day and speak to you again soon. Thank you for listening to this podcast. If you enjoyed it, please follow us on your podcast platform. If you'd like to appear on A Little Bit Radical or have an idea of someone we should speak to, please email podcast at standingongiants.com or get in touch with me on LinkedIn. You can search Rob Fawkes or search Standing on Giants and you'll find me there. Thank you very much and speak to you next time. (laughs) 